Actors, we've all got issues, so let's talk about them. I'm Juan Yala, and welcome to Actors with Issues. Each week, we bring you interviews with actors from across TV, film, and Broadway, taking many deep dives into their careers and getting into the successes, the struggles, and of course, the issues that they face as actors. That's enough about us. Let's dive into the episode. Today's guest is an actor you've seen in How to Get Away with Murder, The Killing, Zoe's Extraordinary Playlist, and here to talk with us all about their role on CW's Walker Independence. Please welcome to the stage, Katie Finley. Katie, thank you so much for being here. Welcome. Oh, hi. Thank you for having me. Uh, so before we dive into the show and uh, the issues, uh, uh, we always start <laughs> with a game. So uh, we're going to do something a little bit different today. We're going to give you some options. So just choose a number between one, two, or three, and then we'll oh. go from there. I mean, that's not terrifying at all. My cat is coming to make sure that I'm going to live through this. Um, I'm going to say three. All righty. So uh, game number three is called What Comes to Mind. So I'm going to okay. just oh, say a person, a place, or something from your life or career. And you just say the first okay. thing that comes to mind. Oh, God. Okay. We'll start easy. Windsor, Ontario. Uh, 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 my mom. New Mexico. This this is actually very hard. See, this is not built for neuroatypical people because sometimes <laughs> things don't come to my mind at all, uh, which is not to say that that happens to everybody. Uh, New Mexico, uh, Dust Devils. <laughs> uh, acting. Cool. <laughs> Could be Sam. <sound. laughs> uh, Shonda Rhimes. Shonda Rhimes. Uh, uh... <laughs> Grey's Anatomy, which is weird because I was on a different show. <laughs> uh, I grew up more with Grey's Anatomy. Psych Chris Henze. Uh, Walker Independence. Hmm. Walker Independence. Well, the thing that popped into my face, my head right now is was Philly's face, Flame and Jonathan Flame and Chambers' face, which is funny because there are many things <laughs> Took uh, face. are involved <laughs> in Walker Independence. But I, I have a picture of Philly's face this close to his face that I use for every react, every emotion, every... <laughs> I think it's the picture of our uh, group chat right now. So that's... <laughs> it comes really readily to mind. <laughs> uh, Catherine McNamara. Angel. Matt Barr. She's a princess. Matt Barr. Oh, God. So Papillas. So papillas are a, a, a like a baked doughy golden brown pocket that they serve with honey here. And they're so nice. And if you described it to someone as a food, you're also describing Matt Barr as a person. <laughs> we figured it out really early on and it makes me laugh. Uh, Jared Padalecki. Jared Padalecki. Season, uh, Supernatural season one, me being 14. <laughs> and going, oh, he's so tall. Uh, Lawrence Cow. Lord's cow. Uh, uh, coach. He has this one coach bag that <laughs> I want. I want all of Lawrence's clothes. Lawrence is my style icon, and he actually does let me have them now. But uh, he has one really good coach hat, and he has one really good coach bag that elevate him above the rest of us. There are, Again, there, this game is hard because there are a lot of other things I could say about him that are more about him, but that was... Mm. I'm so tired, and that was... <laughs> <laughs> He's never going to speak to me again. <laughs> Um, he was on the show recently, actually. His episode went up a few oh, weeks ago. Yeah. His, um, he's going to be better than me. I'm, uh, you've caught me in a state. So. I mean, to be fair, he forgot Robin Williams' name. So <laughs> he had to Google right, it. Never he's mind. Like, oh my God. Robin Williams. Never mind. I take it back. If you played this game with me, I'd be very interested. With him, I'd be very interested in what he had to say about me. <laughs> um, Gabriela Quesada. Oh, I've never heard her name said so the way that her name should be said. <laughs> Gabriella. Ever. Oh, Gabby. Gabby's my hero. Fuck, what do I think of when I think of Gabby? I know I'm not playing this right because I'm thinking too much. You're the first one to play this game, so it's okay. You're setting the setting the bar. Hell yeah. Um, <laughs> when I, Okay, so this involves Gabby, but it's not. When I think of Gabby, I think of sitting in Gabby's car at like midnight in a quiet parking lot somewhere because everywhere in New Mexico closes at like nine. So no, no matter mm. what you were doing, it's going to be quiet by like um, with the windows open and just like talking about shit and yelling and laughing and like crying. <laughs> but I can just see it in my face like a film still doing that. And that's the first mm. thing I think of when I hear Gabby's name. Oh, that's so sweet. And uh, lastly, Kate Carver. 
Kate Carver. Jesus. <laughs> when I think of Kate Carver, oh, you know what? Actually, this is real. Someone on Twitter uh, pointed out, they were like, fact one, Kate Carver carries a silly little umbrella. Fact two, umbrella knives exist. Uh <laughs> End of... And so the first thing I thought when you said that was this this thing that I'm hoping one day will happen in the show, which is just a little, like, mm. blade coming out of the bottom of an umbrella. <laughs> I love it. It's like the penguin. Doesn't his have like a gun in it exactly. and all of that stuff? <laughs> Listen, if I can if I can marry being a Western badass and a villain in Batman, I... <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so I sorry, I know that sense, wasn't folks. that wasn't very no, aesthetic of me. Any of those choices, but that it's that's what I have today. I'm going to think of better ones in about. 20 minutes after I hang up. <laughs> um, so I have always asked folks on the show um, when they first knew when they would be an actor and all of that. But I feel like actors get asked that the most. It's like, so when did you know? What was that aha moment? Which is like, you know, the most like boilerplate type of stuff. So um, I'm curious when you made the decision, though, what was your goal? Did you want to do TV? Were you more of a theater girl? What did you what, what, what were the goals for you at that time? I don't know that I ever made, sorry, I'm, I'm petting my cat. I'm not insane for anybody who's watching the video. She, if I pick her up to bring her to you, she'll leave me. But right now she really, she's sitting just out of uh, view. Um, I don't think that I really made a decision to become an actor. Um, I think that it performance was my happiest, safest zone. And as a, a mentally ill teenager, it, there weren't very many of those in my brain. Um, so I think I did it because it felt like the only thing that was the only thing that felt easy and like it served me and like I was happy and myself. So I don't know that I decided, um, I think I had a lot of other ideas about things I probably could do and I wanted to be in theater. I had no real understanding. Like I, I wasn't a child actor. I grew up in Vancouver. Like I, I wasn't around this stuff all the time. Um, so I think I had the same, like, you go to theater school and they tell you who you are and, you know, you, you have a group of people that are like family and everything that the teacher tells you is right. And one of these days, kid, like, it's really embarrassing to say now, cause now I know people that are on Broadway and they'd be like, <laughs> loser. But I was like, one of these days, <laughs> kids, you're going to like hit the boards and Broadway's calling baby and you'll never look back and you'll do. And, um. I got into TV by accident because a, a friend of mine was going to a an acting for camera class and didn't want to go by herself. <laughs> so I went with her and ended up with an agent. And then I don't know if it, it, it's hard to explain to people what it feels like. TV um, kind of promises you that you're going to be really, really, really special. And you just have to hang on for just one second, please. Mm. And then you hang on for one second for like years and years and years and years. And sometimes... It, like in my case, I was privileged enough that a lot of things happened that I, I was given a lot of gifts that fed that sense that, you know, beautiful, amazing things will happen to you if you just stick around for just a minute because the rewards here, oh my God, they're so much bigger than rewards everywhere else. How could you possibly? And it like recenters your dopamine <laughs> to be less receptive to things that take a long time or things because you just have to, it's like gambling. You just hold on for one second. Mm -hmm. And then you might be in the most incredible experience of your life, making more money than you've ever seen. And you forget that in a couple months, it may be totally gone. So I think that this wasn't your question, but I'm going to loop back around to it because that's what my mom taught me. She's smarter than me. Um, but I think that I ended up in, because I wanted to have a life that was like special and beautiful and being able to act and being able to engage in art felt like a way to get there. And then I ended up in TV by accident because you get addicted to this idea that if you just hang on for one second, there's this, and it, you know, um, but I think my goal really was just to prove to myself that it worked sometimes. Um, which is not very romantic, but I think that that's actually what it is a lot of the time. <laughs> you know what I mean? I feel like uh, that is the case for a lot of 
young actors a lot of us get into theater and get into acting and all of that because we didn't fit in with the sports kids and we maybe weren't the smartest kids in class i know that was the case for me for sure and then when it came around to you seem smart apply apply for a, <laughs> it's all a front i'm an actor too you know hey. <laughs> I've got my Google Doc here, you know. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Sorry, let me move my whole desk while you're trying to talk. Um, and, you know, when it came time to, like, apply for colleges, you're like, oh, they have a theater program. Well, let's keep doing this and mm -hmm. see what happens. And then fast forward, and in my case, you're working for a media company hosting podcasts and talking to actors because I love talking shop. Um, yeah, no but, kidding. Yeah, so with a show like Walker Independence and you having mm – -hmm. um, been part of so many other shows a variety of genres comedies dramas musical shows um and having done stage work as well what would you say is like the biggest difference that you've noticed besides genre but sort of in terms of like your preparation of how things are filmed between a show like walker and a show like uh, how to get away with murder or mantis woman well i mean it, it's kind of apples and oranges i don't think people understand how different I was just about to say to you, I don't think people understand how different shows are. So if you want to talk about not <laughs> being smart enough to be anywhere. <laughs> um, no, I don't think people understand how different the process for different shows has to be, how much budget plays into it, how much mm -hmm. um, the network, the studio that you're with play into it. Um, how, you know, the length of an episode, Man Seeking Woman was half an hour, but it still felt like shooting a full hour because we blew up apartments and attacked people with wild animals and did all kinds of, you know, so. Right. Um, I think that I have a great privilege here because the people that I am working with and for give me a lot of leeway when it comes to asking for Kate to be who I really am. Mm -hmm. And previously in my career, either it wasn't appropriate for me to pull that in, or I was too scared to ask, or... I wasn't at a place in my career where it was reasonable for me to bring that kind of thing up. And I think that here I just accidentally stumbled into a really community minded set of people. Um, not that everywhere else I have been wasn't, but um, sort of, I think there's a lot of post pandemic gentleness hanging around in our working environment. Um, mm. So in terms of me as an actor on Walker, I have settled into Kate in a way that feels a lot more personal and a lot more vulnerable because I'm bringing things up to you know my showrunner and to the writer's room and to my colleagues and my peers that would have felt a little bit too intimate to me before um gender stuff sexuality stuff how i like to be spoken about how i like to be spoken to what my hopes are for this person um uh asking to go against the grain sometimes and you know whether or not it ends up in the program there's a lot of people on this show so um Obviously, we don't have control over every little thing, but I think that I have arrived more vulnerable to this job than I have been in a while. Um, so that's a that's it's a difference that I've noticed. But uh, if we're if we're gonna say because everything I would have said would have been about genre, I've never shot a western and it's bananas. <laughs> um, but if we're gonna take that out of the equation, I think that is the biggest difference in terms of where I'm at in my life coming to this to this mm -hmm. work and to this show. I don't know if that's what you mean. <laughs> Uh, I, I love that you feel sort of like comfortable enough on the show and that the environment is a safe space to be able to express those things and that you get to sort of um, have your input because Lord knows there's a lot of times that actors will make a suggestion and sometimes the showrunner is like, all right, do your job, say the lines, <laughs> you're not a writer. Uh, yeah. We've heard plenty of those types of stories, but it, it's it's great to hear that they That's really terrifying. allow you to um, help flesh out the character and develop them on the way. Yeah. Yeah, it's collaborative. And I mean, you know, I'll be honest, like it's, you know, it's commerce and art, so it doesn't always work. And sometimes people feel left behind. Sometimes people feel pushed or ignored or exhausted or, you know, it all, it all still happens. It's, it's hard to make art in any community of people, especially in a world where, um, you know, there's internalized racist cultural understandings or there's ideas about what sells a show and what doesn't. And there's, there's always stuff to wade through, but I think that the the people we work directly with in our little family and the people who created the show really, really, really care about it. Um, mm -hmm. Which is, I think, maybe the only place I would feel comfortable, the only environment I'd feel comfortable being in at this point in my life. 
and um with your character kate like many of the characters um in walker and or in, in independence in the town itself there's a lot more to her than meets the eye when we first meet her we find out that she's undercover she's sort of living this double life so for you as an actor um was it challenging to play someone who has that sort of like switch that back and forth the sort of um code switching or was it did it feel like acting like she has a job to do and she's there to do the job and that's what she's gonna do yeah i mean well i mean i think that uh, i am very fortunate in my life because as a you know a cis passing straight passing white passing thin um non-disabled person uh i am given a lot of leeway to behave in many ways that many people are not in the world and uh i think that kate i don't know that i gave her too big of a code switch i guess is mm. what i'm saying uh there's minor code switching in queerness of presentation in terms of uh when she is alone or out of persona she is more settled in her body more masculine i don't know if it shows but she feels that way to me like um less formal less decorative in her language um less presentational in her posture less femme uh but also uh, as a as a white woman passing person at the time i think that really the only avenue she'd be questioned through is where's your family where's your husband where are your kids why are you out here alone so i think that her natural ability to hold space means that people don't question her very much. Her natural amount of privilege means people don't question her very much. And uh, running the bar, but running the bar under a man is mm. a, a, an acceptable and safe box for her to be in where people can go, oh, she's a woman, but she's good. So I think in a funny way, I, I, I didn't, I don't play into too much of a code switch because she doesn't really need it. <laughs> Mm. um but i do know that in 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 quieter moments she there is a a a very tired queer person with essentially nobody to talk to <laughs> mm. and very few people who hear like the real tone of her voice the real seat of her gravity and that that can hollow a person out so i think that she's pretty capable until she's exhausted we have that in common yeah I feel like that is very much the reality for a lot of um, queer people or people who have um, identities that are not sort of the, the the norm. And for those listening, I'm doing it with air quotes uh, because, uh, <laughs> Can yeah, just, you know, that is very much a reality for so many people. I feel like, especially when it comes to um, people who are assigned a male at birth, feeling the pressure to have masculine energy and for people who are assigned mm -hmm. female at birth to have feminine energy and that balance mm -hmm. and people can't really express how they feel or if they do too much they are judged for and I feel like that is very much her reality and I love that um I actually watched a clip of you talking about Kate and you saying she's sort of like the mayor of the town that no one no <laughs> yeah. one calls her that but that's basically what she is she's she's keeping the ship running you know and I love that she has that I said in a I said in a, a, a previous thing, I said, you know, I'm really glad that caught on because I really did just start saying it. Mm -hmm. And I just hoped like, it's not a talking point. I just made it up and started saying it. And and now yeah. people are like, oh yeah, she's the de facto mayor of independence. Yep. Because all of us on the cast will try to make it seem like we're the most important. We'll be like, I see everything. I know everything. No one knows <laughs> more than me. I am the secret eyes and ears. And we all do it to each other all the time too. And so <laughs> the fact that I've somehow got it into publicity that I'm the mayor is like... <laughs> that was a chef's kiss for everybody listening <laughs> and um with you know with the name of our show being actors with issues um we sort mm -hmm. of we've already talked about a couple of different things but uh what comes to mind as something that you know now about whether it's acting or show business that you wish you learned earlier on in your career somebody said something really really smart to me this week um i had a very vulnerable week this week because i've learned that the COVID boosters, which awesome, go get boosted, public health, public responsibility, uh, mess with my medication, mess with my antidepressants. So I had like a very, very low week where I uh, didn't have the option of not being just excessively vulnerable and still having to go to work and be around, you know, 50, 60 people all the time. Uh, and one of my producers who I love with all of my 
disgusting little black heart um <laughs> said i don't think people think about how hard it is to be an artist in this form in this way sometimes because you sit around and you wait and wait and wait and wait and wait and wait and wait and, wait, and you're told that you can't work harder you can't work smarter there's nothing you can do you just have to wait and then an opportunity comes along and it floods your entire life, changes everything about your day to day. You still have to stay grounded. You understand that it's a privilege, but then also you kind of feel like you're being treated like a child at summer camp who no one has to listen to. Um, you do your job under sometimes really difficult conditions that aren't conducive to you doing it well. And there's not even anybody to be mad at because you know that everyone directly around you is in the same same position um because making tv is hard and then you give the best performance that you can based on somebody else's words or somebody else's ideas and it gets taken away from you um people there is a director telling you what to do with your mind and body whether or not it makes sense to you whether or not you agree in many environments um and then it gets taken away from you again in post so then they edit what they want out of you. And sometimes you're somewhere that you can trust and they listen to what you care about, what you meant for the scene, what you meant for your performance, what you meant for your storytelling. And sometimes they don't care. Sometimes they throw in something that made no sense. Sometimes they pick you doing a horrendous job. Sometimes, you know, they rewrite the story under you and just use you like a paint by numbers um, mm. in little clips of your face, your body, your like actual real vulnerable human self and you have no control over that and then you have no control over how it's received but everybody's going to come tell you if they don't mm -hmm. like it they're going to come tell you even if you do the most amazing personal work you think you ever have someone's going to come and tell you how disgustingly ugly you are <laughs> um and i think that that process I mean, first of all, I was so grateful that she saw that. She was like, I don't think people really understand how how exhausting it is and what a lack of agency there is there. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think that that process of waiting and feeling like I just had to be as vulnerable and open and energized and raw as possible, specifically when other people ask me to and not outside of that, or I'd burn myself out and die. Um <laughs> I think that process for 12 years, especially starting when your brain is still growing, like your brain doesn't finish growing until you're 27. So starting when you're still figuring out what it is to take care of yourself in the world. Um, the effect it had on me was that I didn't seek happiness. I didn't seek roots. I didn't seek stability because nothing was as addicting as the hit of being validated and then being allowed to do my job. And the idea of doing anything else, anything that took a, a longer time to come to fruition, going to school, I didn't go to college, like uh, um, getting into job areas that it took longer to see results from, all of that was so much lesser um, because it almost teaches you not to value root systems and nourishment and mm. rest because we're also forced into giant periods of rest that don't feel restful, you go insane. Um so I think the biggest gift I gave myself, and this also came uh, with the privilege of being financially stable, which again is, is a privilege. I've worked enough that that's the case. It is not the case for most actors. Um, was, you know, bef before the pandemic, I went, listen, I'm, I'm going to lose my mind. Like I'm, I'm working, but I'm so unhealthy and exhausted. And for some reason I made it into my thirties without an idea of, how to nourish myself when I feel kicked around by a really completely arbitrary and abusive system of hiring and deciding who gets to live their life as a verb instead of in theory and constant preparation. And I like signed up for queer dodgeball and I planted my garden and I decided that I was going to spend as much time at my family's house as possible. I made friends with people that scared me. I, traveled because I thought I didn't deserve to travel unless I was going for work, which again, privileged to have the means and the time. Mm. Um, but we spend so much time defending our job as a real job to people who don't understand it. 
But then we also have to spend so much time telling ourselves it's not everything. It's not that big of a deal. I could do something else. I could go back to school. I'm good at other things. I matter in other ways. That it's like 1984 double think all the time. And through the first 10 years of my career, I would say, even, even when I was being really, I mean, very validated and very, you know, very lucky, I still, you know, was just desperately, deeply hollowed and miserable so much of the time. And I wish that I could tell myself, and I mean, basically anybody who who is looking at this as a career path that like telling stories and demonstrating empathy where other people can see is the thing that holds us together as a society. You understand people better when you can see them experiencing something you've never experienced, you've never seen. You understand people better that are not like you when you watch them feel. And it's important, but it's not, it's not a job about being special. And if you don't take care of yourself and find other ways that you're magical and important, this career path will not do it for you. It will do the opposite. And you will come out loving yourself largely in spite of what it is able to offer you. And that has nothing to do with acting or the art form or the wish to create art with other people. It's just how the way that we've decided to pay people to do it works in uh, under capitalism. <laughs> I know this is a really long answer, but I think about this all the time. Um, and so I, yeah, I wish I could tell myself that everything else is also worth it. And that a war of attrition with network television is not glamorous and does not make you special. And that you're good. Like <laughs> you're good the way you are. And every new brave thing you manage to do in your real life is, is so much more worth it than waiting around for somebody to tell you that you can be a guest star on an episode of something where your wife was murdered and the cops have to come talk to you, whatever, you know, like, yeah. I know that sounds so, I don't know. It probably sounds really cliche, but it like it's cliche for a reason. It took me 12 years to figure out that like going to dodgeball every week and making sure I had a standing karaoke date was going to be better for my mental health than for my life and for my work than like renewing my headshots every year and yeah. panicking. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I feel like it's, these are things that um, actors don't necessarily think about. They think that like, well, if I do all the things that actors are supposed to do, like get new headshots and update my reel and all of that stuff, and, and mm -hmm. then they'll be fine. But, you know, we don't think of if you do make it as a series regular and you have that downtime, like, how are you going to stay sane? How are you going to stay sane between gigs and all of that? Like all everything you're saying is so important. So please don't think that you're like <laughs> rambling because really like I'm taking mental notes and I know so many other people are because it's it's just things you don't think about. It's things they don't teach you in school and things that actors generally don't open up about, you know? Well, somebody said, uh, uh, my my drama teacher who's, um, I mean, the, here, this, here, here's a super cliche thing for everybody. My drama teacher saved my life and is mm. um, one of the most influential people I've ever had the pleasure to be around. Um, I was so exceptionally lucky to have someone to care for me at, at, at such a, a difficult time. And I, I don't really know who I would be if he wasn't there he when I was in like grade nine or something for everybody who has different grading systems I was like 14 um he said if you can do anything else do something else and I remember thinking it was so cynical and like it was a challenge I was like that's what you think buddy <laughs> I'm a you know I was I was privileged as hell too like I was ill but I was like a thin you know white passing all the stuff that means everybody leaves you alone except for being a woman but we also know that that's what white women say when it right so <laughs> to be careful <laughs> But like, you know, I had, I, I was told by the world that there was a reason people would want to pay attention to me. And then I was told by my depression that there was every other reason that no one would pay attention to me and that I shouldn't be here. So it was an interesting juxtaposition. But I remember thinking, you know, that's what you think, buddy. And I finally mm -hmm. understand what he probably meant, which is that if you can, literally, if you can, if you look at something else and it brings you unbelievable joy and you go, oh my God, I want to do graphic design or whatever that that is as as important as valid as possible <laughs> and that, that that it's it's like breadth courses in college it's it's deepening 
-hmm. it's root systems. It's, it's, I'm not just here to wait for someone to need me because there are a million avenues for my own agency and they don't have to be keeping myself busy while I wait for, cause then you never feel like a grown up. Mm -hmm. My friends who don't work in the arts, they'll be like, oh, I can't, I have a meeting at 11. And I'm like, about what? <laughs> <laughs> like, what's a meeting? Everybody has all these meetings. Somebody tell me what you actually talk about. And they didn't realize that I had no idea because this has always been my job. Uh -huh. We have these huge meeting of minds where I talk about what other people do every day and then what I do every day and when it's good and when it's bad and why. And one of my friends went, Kate, I, Jesus Christ, no wonder you're ill. Like this, I would never do that. I would never do that. Like, it's amazing when it's amazing, but the, the other stuff you're telling me about, I would never do that. Right. I was like, really? And she was like, yes, dude. Like, um, but I, yeah, I mean, I'm now, now I'm just talking to 19 year olds everywhere. I'm like, listen, it's special. It's beautiful. It's magical. But like, it's not that you're not special enough. If you want to do anything else while you're doing this or instead of doing this or alongside mm -hmm. doing that, like you have to be a person before you can translate other people. It's a, it is a societal service. It is an art form. It's something that you can be born with the skills to offer to the rest of the world. But like, yeah. they're going to tell you it's about how marketable and how special you are. And we already know who modern society and capitalism decide to assign specialness to and then how mm. often they assign specialness to other people and how difficult it is for other kinds of people to have specialness assigned to them. So I don't know if I'm allowed to swear on this, but like, absolutely fuck <laughs> it, you know, like, it's <laughs> Actually, I'm really glad to know that because I, I start to sound so fucking weird when I don't. You can tell in every other interview when I'm trying to not say the F word every three words, you watch me stop. <laughs> Terrifying. Um, so I don't want to- My cat's still too... here, by the way. <laughs> Petting off screen. Um, Truly. So, I'll pull uh, it. I don't want to take up too much um, more, more of your time, but first, just thank you so much for, for opening up and, and for, for chatting about all this stuff that, again, actors don't necessarily talk about they might in a memoir 30 40 years into the career but <laughs> actors need this advice now they need to to hear all of this now you know and it's thank you just yeah Dude, thank you so much i've been saying i've been saying all week i i say this to cat a lot cat mcnamara and i have a lot of like what are we doing with our lives um <laughs> it did it, it, mental health wise not like obviously we're very very lucky people that are um working and uh, privileged in the ways that a lot of other people aren't but like you know she hits walls I hit walls we get lonely and sad we sit around and cling to each other and go what is that? um but we both started I after um the world opened up a tiny bit uh pandemic wise I just started saying listen the ocean's on fire so um I don't care because the ocean was literally on fire yeah and and it, it's we're in the middle of two pandemics it's it's it, it's just two bananas out here <laughs> like yeah people are being kidnapped in iran it, it, it's it's two bananas out here to not talk about feelings anymore <laughs> and like <laughs> the ocean's on fire so like if anyone wants to come over if, if anyone needs anything <laughs> i don't care anymore yeah it's <laughs> It's, you know, it's been a heck of a, a two and a half years now. I feel like every time we say like, wow, two and a half years of this insanity. Yeah. And, know. you know, it, if, if something's out Global on fire, trauma, then, man. yeah, it's, it's, there's something happening everywhere. It's like, oh, there's things going on in Europe and there's protests and there's just this, everywhere you go, there's something going on. And I feel like we have started to finally started to move on from the guys, this is a pandemic happening your little problems don't matter. Now we're beyond that. Cause we're like, well, the, we you know, not to say we're out of the pandemic because we're certainly not. I still wear masks everywhere. Yeah. We're still getting boosters, but for you. you know, um, I live in New York. I'm going to go on the subway. It is getting covered. Oh my God. Um, yeah, I get yeah. anxiety. I barely, I work from home, thankfully. But like when I do have to go on the subway, I'm like, I don't like <laughs> all the crowds. No kidding. I got sick working in New York. I got sick like nine times through one January. I think my show thought I was lying to them because I lost my voice. I can't imagine. <laughs> trying to exist in pandemic new york yeah <laughs> absolutely brutal yeah um but before we uh go we always end with um a non-rapid fire game so the pressure is off uh right. so we'll fill in the blank usually i'm better at those just so you know i'm <laughs> deeply embarrassed that you caught me in a a, a near uh uh frozen state of exhaustion uh so uh, first uh fill in the blank if i weren't working in the arts i'd be 
there's no answer to that because <laughs> my other dream job is being an art historian so it doesn't <laughs> <laughs> if I wasn't working in the arts if I wasn't working in the arts I would be beekeeping Love it. honestly um uh, what role have you had the most fun playing Well, I mean, come on now. I'm supposed to say the one that I'm doing right now. And I do actually really feel that way about it. Uh, I did a little indie that turned into one of the most beautiful things I've ever gotten to experience in my life with a very special person named James Sweeney uh, called Straight Up. Mm -hmm. And I read the script and it was basically just like someone listened to every way that I was both brilliant and obnoxious and then wrote a script in which I do it. Mm. Um, and it's on Netflix right now and everybody should watch it because it is dear and sweet and it was made for about 11 cents and I'm really proud of it. But I, <laughs> I, I would say in terms of what I felt the most, mm. you know, if I were to direct somebody to just me in a handbag, that's it. Um, but I, I do honestly have to say that I'm having a fucking blast on this show. Mm. I, I laugh more and ruin more takes and do stupider <laughs> things on this show than I think I have ever done at work before. And I can say that with no, with no media talking points in hand. (laughs) Uh, What is the worst advice you've ever gotten? Oh my God. I feel like there's a laundry list of bad things. Yeah. (laughs) I don't know. I think a lot of the bad advice that I get as a femme person is, uh, there's a lot of toxic positivity stuff. There's a lot of mm-hmm. uh, advice that doesn't encourage you to work through feelings or acknowledge feelings or feel them. Um, sort of like an old fashioned coffee mug kind of advice. Mm-hmm. Where, you know, complaining makes it worse, da 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 da, where there's no room, <sighs> you know. Well, I, I heard actually, I heard someone, this is actually was given to somebody else in front of me, but somebody was having a really difficult time with their parents on a show that I was on and like, like really difficult, toxic, exhausting, Mm -hmm. you know, multi generations of trauma um, that were surfacing in different ways. And I remember them saying, listen, I know this sounds bananas, but I just, I fucking hate her right now. I hate her right now. And I don't know what to do about it. And someone else got really uncomfortable and they said, well, you know, they're your family. So you, you need to get over that. Like you need to change that. You can't, you can't feel that way about them. And you need to, you know, that's not going to help you. That's going to bring your energy down. And I was like, okay, except that's not how feelings work. Yeah. That's not how trauma works. That's not how, like it's how they feel is not trauma, the problem. Uh, it's like, you know, change like how you feel, not they should change what they do. It makes no sense. Exactly. But it was, but it was, but it like was the, now. the encouragement to rush through a processing system. Mm when it comes to, you know, multiple generations of, of difficulty and harm and hurt and struggle. And uh, just because the idea that you focus on it as opposed to it being something that comes for you right. is just bananas. Also, people always want to give me a lot of investing advice and I don't, I just don't care. <laughs> I don't care. I've had so yeah. many crypto bros try to talk to oh, me about, I don't gosh. know why they talk to me. Cause like, look at me. I do not. I feel like as soon as I open my mouth, you're like, this is not a sympathetic room for me to be in. But I, I, <laughs> man, oh man, oh man. Do I ever not want to hear about your NFT? Like I, right. I don't need to make substantially more money than any person has ever had in their entire life over the course of the next week. Like, I think we should be eating Jeff Bezos. I'm not trying to be any more <laughs> like the guy than <laughs> Right. American government, I'm not going to eat Jeff Bezos. He's safe, <laughs> unfortunately. But there, those are my two. <laughs> I know some people probably have real snappy answers to these. <laughs> you got stuck with me. Oh, no. We've had interviews go for an hour, over an hour. Are you kidding? God. We've had some like. Was Lawrence funnier than me? Some... Say again? Was Lawrence funnier than me? This is really important. There is a correct answer. So I'm, I'm just. <laughs> <laughs> he made me laugh less. You, you've had me cracking up. Um, ah, I'm gonna tell him that immediately. I'm gonna call him at his mom's house right now and be like, "Hey, fucko, <laughs> guess what? <laughs> I'm being Lawrence for Halloween. This is the most important piece of information to have in this podcast. Love it. <laughs> Borrowing all of his clothes. And um, uh, lastly, in ten words or less, what advice would you give to a young actor? Oh my I god. <laughs> ten words or less. 
don't wait for them. Don't wait for them. <laughs> don't wait for them to see you. Don't wait for them to love you. Don't wait for them to validate you. Mm. You're here for a reason and you're important no matter what. That's not 10 words or less, but I'm not piffy today. That's okay. <laughs> Oswald, well, Katie, thank you again so, so much for, for taking thank the time you. to chat with us. Um, on social media, Instagram, where can our lovely fans find you? Oh, boy, oh, boy. On the hellscape that is Twitter, I am uh, at Kate Dangerfield. I don't know why. <laughs> it was an inside joke when I was, what, 20? When did Twitter start? And I can't remember what it was. I think, People always yeah. ask me, and I have no idea. Uh, I think it was a joke about not getting any respect, but I, it's... And then on Instagram, I am uh, Katie Katronica, which you write K-A-T-I and then find the cartoon that looks like me. It's me. I'm not willing to spell it for anyone. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. And folks, you know the drill. You can follow us on Instagram at Actors with Issues. Follow me at Juaniala Official and subscribe to our show on YouTube, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts for new episodes every Monday and bonus episodes throughout the week. And of course, don't miss Walker Independence new episodes every Thursday on The CW. I'm Juan Yala. This is Actors with Issues, and we'll see you next week.